Welcome to Anchored in Law, an unembedded take on law. We're in conversation with Justice Madlanga of the Constitutional Court. Justice Madlanga, um, let's talk about your experience here at the Constitutional Court. What is a day, in, what does the day in the life of a Constitutional Court judge look like? Um, outside of the obvious, uh, which is uh, court hearings, mm. uh, most of the time we sit glued onto our computer slash laptop screens. Um, we exchange uh, emails. Perhaps let me start by just giving an example of um, a, a case heard in court, uh, what happens post the, the hearing. The allocated scribe will prepare a, a post-hearing note. Sorry, can I stop you? Can we start with what happens before the hearing? Is there anything of significance that happens there without, of course, giving away any we, we, intellectual... We, we, don't, we don't discuss cases. At we all. We don't indicate uh, what each one's uh, views are, mm. except for things like, uh, you know, um, you know, passing comments like, but why did we set this matter down? You know, mm. things like <laughs> <Yes. laughs> mm. Which, of course, doesn't mean... You, we may say that mm. uh, walking into the courtroom, but once we are there, mm. you, you get convinced otherwise. Yes. You know? But uh, no formal discussions, you mm. know, what do you think and why? And none Before of that, the hearing. None of that mm. at all. Uh, then, uh, oh yeah, the one formal thing that does happen is that the allocated scribe will circulate how she or he sees the issues. Mm. These, in my view, are the issues, and then she or, or he will also suggest uh, uh, the time for argument. You know. mm. But of course, in the end, that's, uh, the decision is that of the presiding judge, mm. whether it's the chief justice or whoever else is presiding in the chief justice's absence. Mm. Then after the hearing, the allocated scribe uh, circulates a post-hearing note. Mm -hmm. In that post-hearing note, she or he indicates uh, uh, the direction in which she or he thinks the case should go. Mm. Uh, you know, setting up the reasoning and the proposed outcome. Mm -hmm. And then colleagues comment on that, and that must come out within seven days. Mm -hmm. Colleagues comment on that. Within seven days of the hearing? Of the hearing, of mm -hmm. the hearing. And then thereafter, the first draft must come out, which should be within 14 days of the deadline for comments. Mm -hmm and then colleagues will comment on that again. All of this we do on, uh, online. Yes. We do online. And uh, if it's a straightforward matter, straightforward in the sense that by and large there's agreement, uh, it just proceeds to the second draft, mm -hmm. and then a final draft, which we call a read-through draft. Mm -hmm. But uh, there will be those uh, instances where there is disagreement. Mm -hmm. And where there's disagreement, uh, what we normally do is then to invite a discussion. And uh, it's usually the allocated scribe will say, colleagues, because X and Y views have been expressed, I suggest that we should have a round uh, the table discussion mm -hmm. on those issues. Then we sit down, we discuss, and sometimes we are lucky and they will reach agreement and then the scribe will go that way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not, and then, mm -hmm. hence you will sometimes see different views of people. Yes. Yeah. But from what you're telling me, Judge, um, a judgment should come out of the constitution of the constitutional court after the hearing within a month or six weeks at uh, the most where there is not much divergence. divergence now where there is a divergence one would expect something like two months to perhaps ten weeks but we've had instances instances where litigants have had to wait for up to eight months for a judgment to come out of this court. Why is Some, that? So you, you see, what you sometimes, sometimes you see a unanimous judgment and, uh, and, and you may think that uh, colleagues were agreed right from the beginning and mm. uh, 
you find that in some instances uh, that was not the case at all. Mm. It takes that many months exactly because there was serious engagement, serious discussion. Mm. And sometimes you get to a point where, where you think you are agreed and now you think the, 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 the vehicle is, uh, you know, moving towards the, mm. <laughs> the end point. Yes. And, uh, and then somebody says, uh -uh, but I've reconsidered. No, no, no. I think we are going wrong on this and that and that. Mm. And that again, you know, causes uh, the, dis the, the discussion to start afresh. And uh, it's usually things like those that cause us to, yes. to take a fairly long time. So, I, but, yeah. But, but as I would say, even, even with those fairly straightforward matters, it's very rare that you will have uh, very straightforward in the sense that there's, a, there, there's agreement as to outcome. Mm. Sometimes you find that uh, there's uh, there, there are a bit of bits of tension, sometimes even bits of disagreement on how you get to that end point, which mm. is agreed. You know? mm. Mm. So those two add to the delays. Now. Uh, Usually, even with those, let me loosely call them straightforward cases, mm -hmm. even with those, it's very rare that you will not have at least three drafts, mm -hmm. the third one being the read-through draft. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what causes the delays are the comments all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, but, uh, so, but what I don't quite grasp is where the end result is agreed by the entire bench. Mm -hmm. But the way of getting there, there are differences. Why that should cause a delay? Because one would ex expect that those who differ will write separate concurring judgments, and that resolves the issue. We, we, to a large extent, we want to, in fact, it's not a case of wanting. Mm we discourage a multiplicity of judgments. Mm -hmm. we, we, where it's possible, where it's possible, we want to have unanimous judgments. Mm -hmm. And so for as long as that engagement has not reached a point where we think there is no way we can find each other, mm -hmm. you know, we, we will continue engaging. Of course, we can't do it ad nauseum, mm. but uh, we will continue and until we reach that point where there is agreement mm. and the judgment is unanimous. Mm. But where it becomes clear, you know, at some point, it may be earlier, it may be much, much later, then, mm. then there will be mm. uh, concurrences, separate concurrences. As well. So then from what you're hearing, it's, it's not quite indicative of the divergence of opinions where litigants and advocates or practitioners have to wait for a long time because what what I understand you to be saying is uh, sometimes you agree mm -hmm. at on the outcome but the way of getting yeah. there varies yeah. and so one could find that the judgment would take maybe up to six months mm -hmm. To, to come out, yeah. um, and, and yet it's not a, a, an instance where there is a, a difference yeah. in the outcome. So you, you see the outcome, it's mm. an unanimous judgment, and you ask yourself, yes. if it's unanimous, why did they take that long? Yes, because I'm asking myself, <laughs> I'm asking myself the question yeah. about another judgment that many people are looking forward to. I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> And, and that is the judgment in relation to an application as regards whether or not um, independent candidates should, should be allowed to stand for public office. It's now close to four months. So I take it there is that toing and throwing going on between, between the constitutional court judges. Justice Madlanga, how would you describe your judicial philosophy? I would say uh, it's a philosophy that's uh, deeply rooted in justice mm. or a sense of justice. Mm. Okay, a sense of justice. Um, th there has been a constitutional, not a constitutional, a Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court judge who has reputed to have said um, a court 
is a court of law and not a court of justice. Do you agree with them? Let me preface my response by saying that uh, I have on several occasions said um, law does not necessarily or rather does not always coincide with, uh, with justice. But that said, my own belief, if not philosophy, is that as a judge, whatever the law is, you should be moved or be motivated by doing justice between person and person. Mm. Okay, well, let's, let's explore that a little bit further. Um, I mean, I, there are contract cases, for example. There is this uh, fabled Pacta Sunt Servanda doctrine where the sanctity of contract is held supreme, that if two parties on equal terms enter into an agreement, the one has a favorable bargain and the other, and the, the other has contracted his commercial rights away foolishly, and then they rush to court. There is a school of thought that says you have to interpret the contract as is, and not as it were make a fairer contract for the, part, for the parties other than what they had intended. There is another school of thought that says, well, hang on a second. Um, if one wants to do justice, wants to act in the interest of justice, one cannot just simply look at the, shall we call it, red or black letter of the contract between the parties. One has to consider equity. Now, I know there have been some cases in the Supreme Court of Appeal, and at least one of which I'm aware here in the Constitutional Court, which the Supreme Court of Appeal has refused to follow, notwithstanding the precedents uh, doctrine that a lower court can, cannot differ from a higher court on the same issues and similar facts. Now, when you're saying your philosophy is justice and you're saying the law doesn't always coincide with justice, how does one as a judge of the Constitutional Court deal with an instance such as I've described, where you have a contract entered into between two parties, but it is a very one-sided, lopsided contract. Um, and the one party has got more power than the other. Take an employer and employee, for example. Or to use another example, um, a, a company that awards a tender to the company that requires a tender, but it's a one-person jive. How does one reconcile the letter of the contract and the Pacta Sun Servanda doctrine with the equity doctrine? Um, I will not be able to go into much detail on this one because mm. uh, recently we heard a matter oh. that uh, touches on exactly these issues, uh, the BFD matter. Oh, okay. um, the judgment is still outstanding. Mm. Oh, um, I, just for the I record, was, I wasn't aware of that. No, so. no, 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 not at all, not mm. at all. Um, suffice it to say, uh, uh, as you know, even in the face of the Pacta Sun Servanda principle, mm. um, that could always be upset by, for example, issues of public policy, mm. if the contract is contrary to public policy, then it may be upset or set aside, mm. aside by, or, or rather courts may not mm. insist on uh, it being followed mm. or, yeah, or the need that the parties abide thereby. Mm. Uh, now there are the issues of what exactly informs public policy yes. today. You know, mm. questions about Ubuntu, questions about, you know, the Constitution, the mm. values 
contained in the Constitution, mm. to mm. what extent those influence public policy. In fact, according to, I think, the very first judgment in that issue, but of course in the context of the law of delict, not contract, mm. the commercial matter mm. said mm. that these days we don't have to try to, you know, in the air, you know, try to find out what exactly is public policy. Mm. We have to look mm. at at the Bill of Rights. Yes. That is what informs public policy today. Mm. So the we, issues like those will come into the question of must in this specific contract, must soon serve under the, the mm. part of soon serve mm. under Trump, you know, these issues of public policy to the extent that based on, on our view of public policy these mm. days, you know, um, what those tell us with regard to whether or not the contract should stand. Mm. But as I mm. said... Yes, I no, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, uh, mm. but may, may I quickly just touch on something with mm. regard to, you know, exactly also on contract. Mm. And uh, this thing about being moved by one sense of justice, there is an example also on contract of a matter in which a memo was circulated by one of my colleagues uh, saying that an, an, an application should be dismissed, an application for leave to appeal should be dismissed. Mm. And the co colleague quoted quite correctly a long-standing English law principle which we had followed in South Africa and which had become part of our common law in South Africa. And there's even evidence of it in Roman Dutch law as well. Mm. Portier also sort of suggests mm. that that same principle existed mm. or exists in Roman Dutch law. Mm. But instinctively, when I looked at uh, the colleague's memo, I just said, uh -uh. Mm -hmm. this to me sounds very unjust. It was not so much that I was questioning the existence of the principle, but mm. I was saying, but why do we have such a legal principle? Mm. And I think it dates back from an English judgment of 1904. Mm. And mm. I proposed that we set it down and the uh, colleagues agreed, we set it down, and I tell you, on that principle, we were unanimous. Mm. And we upheld, not only the application for, but the appeal itself, mm. on that We upset that uh, long, the long standing uh, principle. Mm. That was the matter of uh, Mukoni versus Tassos. Yes, so I It was I've just said. instinctively, mm. I, 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 mm. you know, just, no, this cannot be mm. just. Mm. That is what. But, but I should not be misunderstood. By saying that is what motivates me, I am by no means suggesting that I would bend yes, the no. law such that I go outside of the bounds of the law. Mm. Whatever my feelings, whatever my thoughts may be with regard to what I consider to be just, you know, mm. Mm. if the law constrains me, then I too will be led to an unjust conclusion, because mm. that is what the law says. Well, wasn't that the common refrain of judges during the bad old apartheid days? It was, it was. Who, sa who said, look, this is what the law says, I'm afraid my hands are tied, I have to apply this law. But there were few judges yes. who didn't follow that, yes. uh, that, that line, yes. who said, well, this law is unjust, I'm not going to apply it. I think... Yes. Is it Justice Ditkot or...? He would not so much, uh, put it this way, uh, I, I, I guess the difference between what I say and their approach mm. lies in the fact that they would not necessarily move from a pre premise that says, what is just in these circumstances? Mm. Did, did you see what I mean? Yes, yes, no, it I quite... It would more be a question of accepting what the legislature in okay. Cape Town has said. Mm. And uh, at the risk perhaps of uh, sounding insulting to our former colleagues, uh, 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 perhaps it was a comfort zone for them. Mm. But with regard to what uh, Justice did court would do in, 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 in Natal then, mm. It was not so much that he would say, I am not going to follow that law, mm. but it would more be that he would still, within the constraints of the law, carve out 
just outcomes. You know? he, would still be, he would still be purporting to act within the law. He would bend the law, <laughs> yeah. not break it. <laughs> yeah, no, not break it. Like ta yeah. taxi drivers often say, we don't break the law, yeah. we bend it a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, on that note, yeah. thank you, Justice Matlanga. We'll, we'll take up judicial activism and other related philosophies, if you like, in the next segment.